you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, a conference dedicated to what is happening in this world, the division of the world by sectarian strife, by fundamentalism, by the denigration of the individual, by the loss of liberty, by the failure of ideologies, by obsession with violence. I think nothing could be more important in terms of architecture and what architecture can do for people from around the world. So uh, memory, spirit, and the future is something I'm interested in. And of course, the word spirit is normally not used with architecture because architecture is, is made of stone, concrete, glass. It's something heavy. We are almost embarrassed to say that architecture really is a spiritual art because it is an art that at the end is not just for the mind and for the intellect. It is a spiritual art because it affects our heart and our soul, which means the connection to the earth and to what is beyond. Uh, when I was building my first building, the Jewish Museum in Berlin, I thought, how do you create a museum, a place in a city from which six million Jews were exterminated, country, uh, Europe, uh, 50 million others died in that, in that evil time. How do you bring that invisible star of David that connects across the abyss, across the destruction, something which we still should hear, voices that are inaudible, things that are invisible, and yet, what is the, the earth based on? Where, where is the, this building to be standing on? It's not just standing on a piece of real estate, on a piece of ground in Berlin. It's standing on all the names, on those who are not there and yet are part of that great city's history. Jews, non-Jews, others, all those who had a stake and all those who are in that void of the city history. So I was able to build a museum which really is not, I would say, a normal museum. It's not just based on the functional needs of a museum, which of course are obvious, but also on, on para-architecture ideas, on literature, which has to be opened in a new direction. This is uh, Walter Benjamin's great book, Einbahnstraße, One Way Street, which I used as a program how to open those streets, those vistas of Berlin. I also wanted to complete an incomplete opera of Arnold Schoenberg, a great composer who was kicked out of Berlin in 1936. He never completed Moses and Aaron's opera, but I thought, yes, it could be completed in the footsteps of the visitors and the echoes of the void. So there it is, a new building without any entrance. The entrance is through the Baroque building. You descend deep through a void, which is cut deep into the underground because, of course, the history of Berlin and the Enlightenment is also the history of darkness. It is also where the subways of Berlin were paved with stones of the Jewish cemeteries. And you enter a, a, an overture many different roads, three roads that intersect in different ways. One leads to the Holocaust Tower. It's a space which has no exhibits. It's not heated uh, in the winter. It's, it's reverberant space. It has just a glance of light. And I have to tell you, for many years I worked on this project, I didn't see any light. You can, there is no light in the Holocaust. There is no light in the extermination of human beings. But I read an account of a survivor of one of the concentration camps, I think Auschwitz, and she said, when I was locked into the cattle cars, I looked through the crack in the cattle car and I saw a light, I saw a line of light and I held onto that line of light and I believe I survived because no one else around me did because I held to that light. So I did open that sharp light that strikes one in the heart and I also created a garden, I call it the garden of exile. It's a garden where the vegetation is not really accessible. It grows up above you and it changes that, that horizon of Berlin. There is a sense of exile, not only people that have been exiled from Berlin, but the city exiled from itself. And of course, the continuity of Grand Stair, which doesn't end in a grand space, but obliquely shifts the visitors because hope is not something that can be fabricated. It's something that has to be brought to, to the light of the city by every visitor. And as you can see, the, the windows, that, well, there are no conventional windows here in this museum. They are really slashes. If you were to open the museum and unfold it, it would be the map of that star that connects so many Germans and Jews, so many others, that distributes the light across often vacant landscapes of the city, but landscapes that speak still of something that is worth thinking, worth caring, worth caring about, worth remembering. And across that void, across that light, which falls through the emptiness is the memory of the city, the memory of the museum, and a city which is great. Berlin is a fantastic city that moves forward, that moves uh, excitingly into the future, 
And I was able to contribute to the museum further by building the sukkah space for more social events. It was not required in the original program. The museum has many visitors now. Uh, and it has really changed the sense uh, of, of emptiness. It is an abyss, but an abyss which you can incorporate into a hopeful future. And I was recently able to build an academy, a learning academy, across the street in the old Blumenhalle. And I put on it uh, in five languages, German, English, Judea, Arabic, Arabic, English, a statement from Moses Maimonides, one of the great philosophers about a thousand years ago, hear the truth, whoever speaks it. Hear the truth, whoever speaks it. And that's really the entrance to a new program of learning, education, something that is important for everyone. Trauma is an aspect uh, of architecture, unfortunately, that we know well, uh, almost in all cities. Uh, I was uh, lucky to win a competition in Dresden, a city, as you know, that was devastated in the Allied bombings of 1945, completely wiped out, really, from the earth. And if you have a chance to read I will bear witness, Victor Klemper, a great Dresden uh, intellectual who wrote about the horror of the bombing and also the wish that only if the city was bombed would he, his wife, his family perhaps survive these horrible times. Uh, I was able to build a museum for German military history. It's the Military History Museum of Dresden. It belongs to the army, the Bundeswehr of Germany. This is where soldiers are also educated. It's a museum that has been there from the 19th century. It was an armory, then it became Saxon Museum, German Museum, Nazi Museum, a Russian Museum, East German Museum, and of course, in a new democracy, a museum. And you can see that it is a dramatic uh, a a conversation between the old and the new, because most of the architects, all the architects in the competition, put the new extension behind the old walls. But I felt, no, it's not possible to put German military museum behind old walls it's not behind all walls. It should cut in, cut in and speak to the city in a way that is very compelling. So you can see this vector that shifts to the museum. It's displaced. It's off-center. It points to several things. First of all, it's cut into the museum, to the, which I renovated, 19th century structure. It faces the, the city of Dresden, so there is an ability to see the, the, the city rising from the ashes. At the same time, the self-similar form of this triangle they are exactly the three points from which Dresden was destroyed in the Allied bombings. Uh, the, the horizontal building really tells the story of German military history from 13th century on till today. And you can see that it's interrupted off-center between 1914 and 1945. Those horrible years where militaristic history, where totalitarianism took over and destroyed much of the world. And that is that shift. And within that space, completely different museum exists. It's no longer a museum with the columns and the military equipment and the weapons, but a museum that raises questions to the visitors. Why do people participate in organized violence? Why do people follow fanatical leaders? What do people think? It's a museum of military history, but it's also a museum of peace. And there it is, that wedge traversing the entire structure of the building, emerging high up above the building itself in a translucent way and combining the military history in the arsenal with all its weaponry, with a cut, you can see the columns are cut very radically and you enter a totally different space in which, for example, you learn how human beings have, have taken animals and enlisted them in war, not just elephants and lions, but bees and dogs and monkeys have been enlisted in man's inhumanity to man. And the, the museum deals with interesting phenomena, the Dora rockets created by slave labor, uh, the things that drop from the sky and kill and maim, and even toys, children's toys, so often based on military equipment. Then you ascend, and, and from this point of ascent, where you are informed about many cities that were destroyed from Dresden, Vialichka in Poland, Coventry in England, cities uh, all over Europe, you can see that view of Dresden, and you ascend into this open space where you can reflect on what it was the meaning of a city, the greatest palimpsest of history, the greatest witness also to what is possible, and you see people there suspended in front of the military uh, museum, in that air of the city in a question mark. And I think that's important that cities should, uh, architecture should ask questions. You know, science ask questions, arts ask questions, uh, medicine ask questions, uh, biology ask questions. Architecture should also be able to pose fundamental questions. Why are we building? What are we building? Who is it for? And how does it feel to transmit this sense of urgency 
to the public at large. Well, rebirth is a key idea in architecture because without rebirth, there is really nothing. And I have to say that uh, it, to me, it will always be in my mind those two dates, September 11, 2001, because that was the day after 12 years that the Jewish Museum opened. I worked on it for 12 years. It was not an easy project politically in any way. And at the same day, the museum opened and I said, my God, people will be able to enter and, and, and enter that history, Jewish, German history, and see it. And then the museum closed just a couple of hours after opening because it was the day when New York was attacked and there was such an uncertainty. So those two events sort of collided and how lucky for me, how strange that I wound up being the master planner at Ground Zero after a large competition. Now, I called it Memory Foundations because it's the foundations of memory in the city of New York. What happened? What is it about? And also the future of New York, future of such a fantastic city, open, tolerant city. Uh, and I based it on a number of things. I based it, first of all, uh, not about building uh, buildings in the center of the site, where most of my colleagues uh, propose megastructures. I wanted to build nothing uh, where, where the event happened, because this is where people perished. And though it is a piece of real estate in New York, it is a sacred ground to me. Nothing should be built there. At the same time, well, it is required to, to build 10 million square feet of office spaces, millions of square feet of infrastructure, and so on and so on. But I wanted to base it on symbols, on emblems that mean something. The Statue of Liberty, Flame of Liberty, Open Space, uh, uh, 1776, the Declaration of Independence, things that really matter to everyone in the world. And here it is from the early sketch on the left to the latest renderings. You can see that across so many divides, political, emotional, social, uh, economic, project sought consensus and brought consensus to many, many different partners, families of the victims, the governor of New York and New Jersey, who control the Port Authority, who owns the land and leases the land to private developers and the architects, uh, city of New York with the mayor of New York controlling the streets of New York, path authorities with path trains and so on. So it's really a, a, a mirror of the complexity of the great city. And as I said, nothing should be built in the center. That should really be a space a public space, a social space, a space for people to come together. And around it, starting with the Freedom Tower, 1776 feet high, the buildings are spread to make them lower and to create a better sense of streets, to create a neighborhood, not just stand alone icons of architecture. And there it is in the early model, uh, a, a, a new neighborhood with a significance, with the memory of what happened. Now, here are the different elements. In yellow, you can see the buildings standing in grid, but really spiral. That the footprints in the park, the purple is the slurry wall, and the red is the wedge of light, which I will explain. The slurry wall is that huge dam, which, which we have, should never have seen, which, which was exposed during the attack on New York. And when I descended to that ground, some 75 feet from, from the street level, I felt this is wh wh what is important here, is to touch, to be on the space. By the way, had this wall collapsed, all of the New York subways would have been flooded by the power of the Hudson River, which is just on the other side. So it's a wall that supports the site, and I thought it should still be visible to the public. And indeed, in this rendering, you can see it is visible to the public and will soon be part of the museum. So from the footprints at the street level all the way down to bedrock is a public space, space of emotion, space of remembrance, space of encounter with reality. And uh, the Memory Foundations, of course, has the, uh, where the building stood, the footprints. And I brought water into the site because I thought it was very important in this busy part of New York to have the screen of water, acoustics of water, to make the experience of people personal, intimate. You can read every name. You can think about what happened there. You can absorb it, not just as some sort of a symbol, but as a reality. And that is now open to the public. Millions of people have already been through it, even though the rest of the site is still a construction site. I added an additional element called the Wedge of Light. The Wedge of Light is a plaza, which is uh, from Broadway. And I wanted to incorporate, you can see on the right, the shadow of the church, St. Paul's Church because St. Paul's Church was an important place immediately in the aftermath of the attack on New York. It was a church which provided emergency services. It's a place where people tried to find their loved ones who were lost. And that wedge of light is determined by two hours of the attack, 846, September 11th, when the first tower was hit, and 1028 a.m. when the second tower collapsed. So it's a space in light. And this space is a public space that leads you to the memorial itself. And the building standing, in that configuration of liberty, 
And I think that's important, that the buildings signal not just that they are beautiful buildings, office buildings, but they are buildings that shape a space without shadows on the memorial, but also reaffirm what the Statue of Liberty is all about. It's not just an icon, as, as Emma, Lazarus, uh, Ella, Emma Lazarus wrote on it, uh, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. So it's about freedom, and you will see this silhouette of that, of that torch of liberty in the skyline of New York, and it is under construction, it's a work in progress, it's complex, it's ongoing, but tower, Freedom Tower is almost finished, Tower number four is almost finished, Tower number three is highly constructed, station is under construction, maybe two more years, memorial is open, museum will open next year, so it is a work in progress, and I want to say that's true. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. That's what faith is. Architecture is based on faith because it's based on hope and it's also proof of the things that you cannot see because it is based on a deeper faith than just making a building. And I end here where I began. I was an immigrant to New York, uh, just like many others, millions of others. I arrived by boat. Early in the morning, my mother woke us up, my sister and I, and we stood up on the ship. We had no language, we had no money, we were just immigrants, and we saw this amazing skyline of New York that is the proof of the complexity, the liberty, the, the passion, the desire that there is something more in the world that we can have. And, of course, the Statue of Liberty was the, the key, I think, to me about what is New York. New York is a city of tolerance. New York is a city that welcomes people. New York is a city where people can live with each other. And that is what the project is about. It's about justice. It's about human rights. It's about accessibility. And it's about the fact that the world that, that life, in this case, is victorious, not the evils that befell New York on that fateful date. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm thanks to Daniel Liebeskin. Thank you.